In this lecture, we will be talking about some of the legal and ethical issues involved with clinical assessment, in particular, the use of standardized tests. It's important for us to consider legal and ethical issues to ensure that our testing practices meet quality standards and do not present any danger or harm to our clients. Before we get into some of the particular legal and ethical standards, let's look in general about testing and how it's perceived. Within the general public, there are certain common misconceptions about testing that influence how it's viewed and perceived. For one, there is a belief that tests do not measure creativity and individuality. People contend that standardized tests simply are designed to assess a particular construct or a particular variable. Many times in school settings, you hear teachers, and parents, and administrators complain that classrooms are now teaching to the test, whereas the material that's presented and the material that's expected to be learned is only indicative of the content of the test. Another misconception is that tests are only used to label people. The whole reason we test people is to be able to slap a name or a diagnosis on that individual. As counselors, we know that that's hardly the truth. While tests are helpful in diagnosing and clarifying some of our clinical hypotheses, we know that they're not the only source of information. Test scores should be interpreted within the context of other information we gather about a client. A third misconception is that tests invade an individual's privacy. Testing, when presented appropriately to clients, should be a mutually agreed upon activity. Clients should be prepared to participate in the testing process after receiving informed consent. It's during that informed consent that they're told exactly what the testing process will entail and what their involvement will look like. Yet another misconception is that tests give inconsistent results. That may be the case with some poorly designed test or non-standardized test, but today most of our proprietary standardized tests have been structured in a way that they are quite reliable. Along with this, people also believe that tests don't really tell us the true story about the individual. I would contend that if individuals, clients, are putting forth a good faith effort and truly participating in the process, then the results will be indicative of how they're acting, thinking, or feeling. Another misconception is that tests are often grossly misinterpreted. This has been an issue in the past but hopefully as counselor training programs put more emphasis on testing and assessment, this no longer holds true. And finally, there's a misconception that tests are unfair or biased. As we talked about when we discussed reliability and validity, the test in and of itself has none of these characteristics. It's how it's used and the information it's used to collect. When counselors use instruments in appropriate ways, then they do produce fair and unbiased information. In general, the entire process of testing 
is very delicate. These activities stretch beyond what we traditionally hold in terms of the beliefs on client rights. When testing and assessing clients, we're gathering information, sometimes personal information, that we may not have otherwise gotten in the course of our conversations with clients. We're then going to be using that information to make some decisions. It is for this reason that we need to be extra careful in how we present the process, conduct the process, and then utilize the results in interpreting what they share about a client. Due to the weight that test results often hold, the practice of testing is closely regulated ethically and legally. Testing has become a big business. It's also one of the primary sources of malpractice suits against counselors. Because test results are used to make important decisions, whether they be admission to a college or university, treatment protocol decisions, the balance of these decisions is meaningful. And so to protect our clients as best as possible, we have ethical and legal guidelines to guide us. So we've been talking about these terms, ethical and legal. And at the beginning, I want to make a distinction between the two. Ethics refers to what we should or should not do. It's a set of principles that establishes norms of conduct that we should follow. Ethics are created by organizations or professions. These organizations develop a code which governs practice by its members. The American Medical Association, the AMA, has a code of ethics for physicians and doctors. The APA, the American Psychological Association, has a code of ethics for psychologists. And ACA, the American Counseling Association, has a code of ethics for counselors. As professionals, we are expected to adhere to the code of ethics relevant to our professional organization. Counselors are not held to the standards of the AMA or the APA. Within the conversation of ethics, we have really two different types of ethics, mandatory and aspirational. Mandatory ethics are the bare minimum. These are the standards that everyone must adhere to in the profession. In a sense, these are the minimal competencies. An example of a mandatory ethic in the counseling profession is the ethical standard that prohibits sexual or romantic relationships with clients. All counselors are required to adhere to this ethical standard. An aspirational ethic is one that goes above and beyond. These are more higher order. These are counselors who don't focus strictly on what the professional guidelines say. They go above and look at what the human aspect is. What is the right thing to do towards a fellow human? Opposite of ethics are laws. Laws are what we are required to do as a result of federal or state legal mandates. 
So laws are created by government and legislators. They're designed to control or restrict the public, or in this case, a profession, counseling. The laws are put in place to safeguard those with whom counselors work so that our clients are receiving the best possible care. Now when it comes to testing and assessment, there are ethics and laws that we need to be aware of. And we'll begin by looking at ethics. Because of some of these negative perceptions and the misconceptions that we talked about earlier, Professionals are required to use best practices. As counselors, we should be able to demonstrate that what we're doing is accepted standard practice amongst professional counselors nationwide. How do we document that what we're doing is standard practice? Well, the ethical guidelines, or the ACA Code of Ethics, forms the basis for deciding what we should or should not do. These ethical guidelines will then be used as a benchmark or standard by which our actions and behaviors are judged. If it appears that what we're doing, practice-wise, adheres to the ethical standards, then we would be deemed to be practicing using best standards. If our practice deviates from what's listed in the ethical standards, we may be subject to lawsuit. Now we've talked about the ACA of ethics, but it's not the only source of ethical information. The ACA Code of Ethics is something that's covered by all members of ACA. And there currently are over 53,000 members of ACA. But these codes of ethics are also used by other organizations. State licensing boards, which license professional counselors, mandate that counselors adhere to ethical standards. In many states, it's the ACA Code of Ethics that is used. We also find ethical information in the RUST statement. And RUST stands for the Responsible Use of Standardized Tests. A copy of the RUST statement is provided for you on Blackboard. The Rust Statement was developed 10 years ago by organizations that were interested in promoting best practices of standardized test usage. It includes a list of activities that counselors or other users of tests should be taking to ensure that the testing process is a smooth, painless, and ethical process for clients. A similar document, the Code of Fair Testing Practices in Education, also came out in 2003. This looks at how tests and assessments should be introduced and administered in school settings. If you intend to work with school children or in a school setting, this would be an important document to look at as it will help you navigate the process of testing children in gaining parental consent. To help clients, there also is a rights and responsibilities of test takers. 
this guideline is written specifically to the test taker or the client. It shares with that individual what it is that they are expected to do as part of the testing process and what they can expect their counselor to do in return. A copy of this document also appears on Blackboard and it may be a good idea to either discuss this with or distribute to your clients prior to testing. It's a good way to share with them all that is involved in the testing process so that they will be able to provide you with informed consent. And then lastly, we also find ethical information in the KCREP accrediting standards. And KCREP is the accrediting body that looks at accreditation for counselor training programs. Included in the document are a list of some ethical guidelines that students or recent graduates of counselor training programs are expected to know and demonstrate. Because the ACA Ethical Code is the dominant ethical guidelines for counselors, we'll focus on that one going forward. There are several different parts of the code that deal with different counselor activities or client-counselor relationships. But overall, there are some general principles that guide what it is we as counselors need to be doing. The first is that counselors should maintain professional competence. As a counselor, you are the trained professional in the client counselor relationship. It is inherent on you to make sure that your skills and knowledge level are current and up to date. This may require you to participate in continuing education or further skill development as you proceed in your career. Ethically, we as counselors should also promote integrity within the discipline. Among mental health professions, counseling is one of the newest. As such, there's still a struggle for counselors to develop professional identity. One of the ways that we can strengthen on our identity and strengthen our reputation in the general public is to operate with a set of standards that demonstrates that the work we provide is high quality and appropriate. To do so, it's incumbent on us to uphold the professional standards. It's one thing to have them listed for others to read, but it's far more important for us to demonstrate in our practice that we do in fact adhere to these standards. Counselors should also ensure respect for human rights. In the past, there have been many gross violations of human rights, both in research, assessment, and testing situations. As we've become more aware and knowledgeable, it's become a greater concern that we're protecting human rights, that our activities do not infringe upon these rights or place a person in harm. Our work as counselors should also contribute to society. There should be a positive effect of 
of counseling. In other words, clients, their families, friends, and communities should be able to feel the impact of the work we do with those who seek our assistance. And then finally, the ethical codes help us identify our civic responsibilities. What is it that we as counselors should be doing to promote a healthy environment and a healthy living situation for our clients, future clients, or even those with whom we never will work with individually? In other words, how is it that we can make the world a better place? for all involved. Now while these are some general ethical principles, there are some that specifically speak to the practice of testing. In standard E1B, we see the following. Counselors are responsible for the appropriate application, scoring, interpretation, and use of assessment instruments, whether they score and interpret such tests themselves or use computerized or other services. What this standard tells us is that as counselors, we are in charge of the testing process and all aspects of it. It then becomes important for us to make sure that we are fully versed or well learned in the process of administering a test so that the results produced by the test and the way in which they are related to the client are done in an ethical and safe manner. We also have an ethical responsibility to choose the best possible tests. Here's where we look at issues of validity. Are the tests that we're selecting valid for the specific purpose we intend to use them? The tests we choose should have been chosen for a reason that matches what the client is presenting with and what we hope to do in treatment. It should not be a test that's selected because it's the popular test. It's one that we had been wanting to use private or it's one used by others in our practice. We want to make sure that the tests have adequate psychometric properties. When we talked about reliability and validity, we talked about certain coefficient values that we looked for to determine whether or not a test was psychometrically sound. In other words, was it reliable and was it valid? Counselors also have the ethical responsibility of ensuring that they're using the most up-to-date current versions of tests. In the 1940s, the MMPI was released, and it was one of the dominant personality measures in all of counseling and mental health. Eventually, the MMPI-2 was introduced as a revision to that original instrument. In many ways, the new instrument strongly outperforms the old version. Content has been strengthened, and the norm samples used are more diverse than they were originally.
because there's a new version out, it would be unethical for a counselor to still be using the MMPI original version. So when we select instruments, we need to make sure that the instrument we're selecting is the most current version. We also need to make sure that we are properly trained to give the test. Or if we're not the one specifically giving the test, the administrators that we use are trained to give the test. This training could vary from test to test depending on how complex or how standardized the administration process. In all situations the test manual should be read to ensure that we are following the exact standardization administration protocol for that test. Another ethical standard we talk about is E2A. And this one states that we as counselors need to recognize the limits of our competence and only use those tests and assessment devices for which we've been trained. There are hundreds, probably even thousands of psychological tests or intelligence tests or educational tests that can be used as part of the counseling process. Some are quite simple and easy to use. Others are far more advanced. When selecting tests, we need to make sure that the tests we use are appropriate for our skill and training level. Using a test that's beyond our skill or training level has the potential to do more harm for a client then it does good. So how do we know what's to use? We need to look at test user qualifications. Questions that we should be asking. What's the purpose of the test? For what reason will it be given? What are the characteristics of the test? Type of test it is. Structure of the questions. What is the setting and condition of the test? Individual test, group test, standardized, non-standardized. And what is it that the test user or administrator has to do? How hands-on is our role in the process? Fortunately, a lot of this has been determined for you. All of the testing companies and publishing houses have established user qualifications to help you better understand what it is you should be using in your practice. Tests are divided up into three general categories. A level A instrument, a level B instrument, and a level C instrument. Level A instruments are general use tests. These can be used by anyone who reads the test manual and familiarizes themselves with the test protocol. No specific educational requirements are made on these tests at the A level. At the B level, Test users must have a graduate degree, a 
in counseling, psychology, or a related field. As part of that graduate program, they should have completed coursework in testing or assessment. And for counselors, one of the KCREP core areas is assessment. So master's level training programs that are accredited will have this educational experience placed in it. The highest level, level C, these are tests that require advanced knowledge and practice. In most cases, a doctorate is required to administer these tests. In some situations, specific coursework in that individual test is required. To use some of the intelligence tests, doctoral level coursework specifically in intelligence testing is required. To use the Rorschach inkblot test, coursework in that test is required. It may seem limiting, but the purpose of these different levels is to ensure that the test is being used in a safe and competent manner by individuals who fully understand or are fully trained to use it appropriately. So I mentioned earlier the test taker rights and responsibilities. What is it that clients are responsible for? Here is a list of some of the items that clients should be responsible for. It may be best if we go over this list with clients during the informed consent process. You'll see several items listed and the basic focus is on helping clients know what it is that they're taking making sure that they realize that they can and should ask questions, seek clarification, and make sure that they fully understand what they're being asked to do. Clients also are required to come to sessions on time, be prepared to take the test, follow all instructions, and to report any issues that they see that may have inversely affected their performance. Our responsibilities include selecting appropriate tests to use. We've already talked about test selection being important. We also have the responsibility of safeguarding client welfare. We need to protect clients' privacy, to not disclose test results to individuals who are not on a need-to-know basis, maintain confidentiality, and to avoid using stigmatizing labels based solely on the results of a test. We need to maintain the integrity of the test, and that means following the standardized administration protocol, collecting all of the test items at the end, keeping them safe and secure so as not to compromise the test by having copies of it out and available in the public. And then finally, we're responsible for educating clients. Again, providing them with the information they need to make a 
sound informed consent. To help further discuss educating clients, I've separated it into two areas. Before the testing begins and after testing. Some of the items that you should be discussing and covering with your clients before a test are the purpose of the test, why are we giving it, what we hope to do with it, What was the criteria used for choosing the test? So talking with the client about why we picked this test as opposed to another that may measure the same construct. What are the testing conditions made available? Is there any room for variation to account for learning disabilities or special needs clients? What is the specific skill to be measured? So why is this test being used? What will it share with you, the counselor, about me, the client? How it will be administered? How it will be scored? And what types of questions might clients see. Some tests provide you with sample items that can be given to clients to help familiarize them with the questions that they will see on the actual test. If this option is not available, it may be helpful for you to discuss with your client types of questions. So you may let them know that this is a rating scale. You'll be asked to rate your level of agreement from a strongly agree all the way down to a strongly disagree on a number of items. Or you may be asked to endorse your support of an item. However the test is structured, it's helpful for you to share with the client what questions will look like. After the test, we still have some ethical responsibilities. We should be noting any unusual testing conditions that might have impacted the results. Did anything unusual happen during the testing? Was there a fire alarm? Did the power go out? We should note any behavioral observations. How was the client taking the test? Were there any visual cues of stress, anxiety, anger that may red flag certain areas of the test? These may be areas we would like to come back to and discuss further as we continue talking with the client. Depending on how many clients you're testing, whether it's individual or group, you also can make note of the client's response style. Did the client go through a 200 item test in five minutes? Did they spend equal amount of time on all items? Do their answer keys show any randomness or is there a defined pattern of responses? These all give you an indication of how serious the client was taking the process. And then finally we want to make note of testing details. The time, place, and day that testing occurred. We all know that these variables can impact test performance. Tests given earlier in the week may be more stable and consistent than tests given later in the week, on Friday afternoon. Tests in the morning or mid-morning may produce 
more accurate and reliable results than tests right before lunch or right before the end of the day. So there are a number of ethical issues that we need to concern ourselves with. Let's now turn to the legal issues. One legal issue that you may see a lot, particularly if you work in school settings, is FERPA. And FERPA stands for the Family Education Right to Privacy Act. This act was enacted in 1974, and it gave parents the rights to inspect their child's academic records. So children who are minors under the age of consent, their parents have the right to see their records. These parents also have the right to determine who has access to their child's records. They could grant access to anyone they choose. Parents also have the right to view children's test scores and amend records if relevant. So if an error is noted, parents could have that part of the record amended. As we talk about access to records, it's important to know what is considered a part of a student's educational record. According to FERPA, educational records include written documents, case notes, intake forms, any student advising folders, any computer media, videotapes, audio tapes, digital recordings, films, or photographs we have of the student all constitute their educational record. What is not included in the educational record are any private notes of staff or faculty members. So as a teacher or a counselor, you keep separate notes about students to help jar your memory and remember what it is you are working with them on or talking about. Those are not part of the educational record. Also not part of the educational record are any police records or medical records or any aggregated statistical data collected on the part of the school. So state testing, MCT2 testing, scores are not part of the academic record because they were collected as part of the practice of school-wide assessment, not individual assessment. Scores on these standardized tests are used to rank schools, not individual students. In terms of assessment practice, the FERPA law also said that students cannot be tested without parental permission. And that information included on these tests or included in the data gathered by using these tests cannot be used in a way that is detrimental or harmful to the student or the student's family. Similar to FERPA is HIPAA. HIPAA is the Health Information 
Portability and Accountability Act. This relates to all clinical or medical facilities outside of school settings. Such items that are included in clients' rights include the right to request certain restrictions on certain disclosures. Clients have the right to determine who has access to and who cannot see what's in their record. Clients have the right to receive confidential communication. They can inspect and copy information in their file by making a request. They can amend information that may be inaccurate. And they have a right to know of all disclosures who the information was shared with. Other physicians, other clinicians, family members, employers. As counselors, it's important for us to maintain information on our clients for a period of six years. In doing so, we remain compliant with HIPAA and also have information on hand that clients may request. Following this six-year period, it's recommended that you destroy records as you no longer are required to keep them. Another issue we look at is the Civil Rights Act of 1991. This law helped to codify testing principles. Prior to this, we had issues where separate norming groups were used for different diverse groups or ethnic populations. Following the Civil Rights Act, it was established that tests had to use diverse norm groups, whereas the norm group used was representative of the entire population, and there were not separate versions for different groups of individuals. In other words, an African-American client who takes a test would be compared to the norm group and not specifically to a group of African-Americans only. Another legal precedent was the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. In this law, it was established that those administering tests had to provide reasonable and appropriate testing accommodations. Now I highlight the terms reasonable and appropriate because it's the test administrator who determines what it is that can be done. The law states that you're to make a good faith effort to accommodate clients, but these accommodations should not disadvantage you in any way. They should not cause you any financial, emotional, or psychological harm, nor should they hinder or impede your business practice. Some common accommodations we see are extended times, alternative locations, larger print tests, perhaps a computer administration rather than a paper and pencil. So if clients have individual needs, we should assess them individually 
and determine whether or not we could reasonably gather the information we need in an alternate manner. If we can, and it doesn't hinder the counseling process, we should by all means move forward with the accommodations. Two similar laws we see are Public Law, or PL 94-142, and PL 99-457. PL 94-142 stipulated that fair and equitable access to education should be provided for everyone. That all children had the right to a free and equal education. It was the educators, then, who were responsible for identifying and providing special education for those who needed it. Children did not have to self-identify. When special education accommodations were made, they needed to consider the least restrictive method of providing these accommodations. Did a student need to be placed in an alternate school program? Could they be taught in an inclusion program? Perhaps they just needed an after-school tutor to help them. PL 99-457 extended that law to children above the age of three. So whereas before it was a K through 12 ruling, and now extends down to preschool and before school ages. We also see some legal issues related to testing and assessment in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA Act of 1990 and subsequently 1997. When diagnosing disabilities, multiple testing methods must be employed. So multiple pieces of data must be gathered so that we could corroborate what it is we're seeing. Assessment must look at both cognitive and behavioral factors as well. We cannot make diagnoses on only one of these factors. And then finally we could look at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This has come up several times over the past 50 years. And essentially, the legislation here governs how employees are selected and how an equitable process needs to be in place for these high stakes decisions. These guidelines or these legal mandates were placed on all agencies that received government funding or engaged in public employment. And so you find this at the bottom of Mississippi State University's website. You find this on most applications for jobs that you go for. That there will be no bias towards members of any protected group, whether it's by ethnicity, gender, cultural group, socioeconomic status, military status, sexuality, disability. There are several different variables that are contained under this Equal Employment and Civil Rights Acts. Now, most of these acts that we've just talked about 
were not developed specifically for testing practices, but they did include language that's relevant to counselors during the assessment and testing phases of counseling. The remaining that we'll look at are legal precedents that centered around assessment and testing. There are five particular cases that you should be familiar with as it relates to assessment practices. And we'll briefly go through these and talk about what the case revolved around and how the ruling from this case influences our practice as counselors. The first one we look at is Griggs versus the Duke Power Company. So Duke Power was a southeastern electricity and power company. In the 1950s, they had a policy whereby African American employees were only allowed to be poll workers. They did the hard labor job setting the poles and running the lines. They were not allowed any of the office positions or management positions. Following the Civil Rights Act, when equal opportunities needed to be presented for all races, Duke Power implemented a new policy. Although African Americans were allowed to apply for these management or office positions, the position notices for these jobs stipulated that applicants needed to possess a high school diploma and they needed to pass a series of aptitude tests. African Americans were now eligible to apply, but for many years they were not extended an opportunity for education. So many did not have a high school diploma nor were they capable of passing the aptitude tests. A lawsuit was filed on behalf of African American employees and the courts found in their favor. The courts ruled that neither requirement, the high school diploma, nor the aptitude test scores could be used because they did not measure skills needed for the job. The result of this ruling, if we're making decisions, the information we gather to make a decision needs to be relevant to that decision. If I'm hiring you to be a lifeguard, your ability to do calculus is not very relevant. For me to give you a calculus exam as part of the screening rather than a swimming exam or a CPR exam would not make much sense. So when we assess individuals, the information we're assessing for should be relevant to the decisions we're trying to make. The second case we could look at is Larry P. versus Riles. Here in the 1960s in California, the Department of Education was using IQ scores to determine who was placed in special education programs. A benchmark score was determined and those failing to meet that score were placed in special ed programs. It was these IQ scores and these IQ scores alone that were used to make placement decisions. A review of the placements showed some discrepancies. In 1969, for example, minority students represented only 9% of the student population in California yet they represented 27% of students in special education programs. 
it was quite apparent that minorities were overrepresented in special education programs. A lawsuit was filed and the courts ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, stating that additional criteria were needed for special education placements. An IQ score alone could not be used to make these placements. Additional information needed to be gathered. And there needed to be appropriate norm grouping. Individuals had to exhibit behaviors and intelligence levels that were different than those from their norm or peer groups. Another education related lawsuit was in Florida, Deborah P. versus Turlington. In Florida, high school students are required to pass an end-of-year competency test for their high school diploma to be awarded. So at the end of their senior year, there's a competency test they must take. Regardless of what their GPA or their class rank was, a passing score was needed on this exam. A review of the scores showed that African Americans had an 80% pass rate and white students had a 98% pass rate. Far more African American students were not passing than white students. This problem was analyzed and it was determined that the content of the exam was biased. The material presented on the exam was not traditionally taught in some of the more rural, poorer communities. Students at those schools were at a disadvantage. They would be tested on material they had never seen before. As a result of the court's ruling, statewide competency exams had to be constructed and normed in a way that they tested a common curriculum, a curriculum that was covered by all students. These exams also needed to be publicized well in advance so that individuals and students had the opportunity to best prepare for the test. Recently, you may have seen on TV the Scripps National Spelling Bee. The Spelling Bee has grown in popularity each year and is now televised on ESPN. One of the controversial changes to the test this year was the addition of a vocabulary written test. Contestants not only had to spell words correctly, but they also had to take a test demonstrating their understanding of what the words meant. While the spelling bee was held in May, this ruling of a vocabulary test addition was not made until the beginning of March. Many students and their parents complained that they did not have enough time to prepare for this new test. Under the guidelines of this lawsuit, it could have been argued that they would have needed to provide further advance warning of the test, perhaps at the beginning of the school year last fall. One last education issue we could look at was Sharif versus the New York State Department of Education. This was in the late 1980s. The state of New York was awarding scholarships and tuition breaks. 
all students who attended high school in New York school districts would receive these scholarships if they scored above a certain cutoff score on the SAT. Ultimately, it was ruled that this practice was unconstitutional because it did not use multiple sources of data in making scholarship decisions. Only this SAT score was used. There was no looking at school grades or other indicators of academic performance. The reason this lawsuit was brought up is that there was a gender bias. Males who traditionally score higher on standardized tests were being offered a significantly greater percentage of the scholarships that were being offered. And then the final lawsuit we could look at is the Soroka versus Dayton Hudson Company. Dayton Hudson Company is the parent company which owns Target department stores. In the 90s, those wishing to be security guards at Target were required to take a personality screening exam known as psych screen as part of the hiring process. Now these security guards were unarmed and their job required them to monitor the store, protect the safety of the customers, and prevent against shoplifting or any other disrupted behavior on the part of customers. The psych screen is an instrument that combines items from the MMPI as well as the CPI, the California Personality Inventory. There are several items on the psych screener that went well above and beyond the boundaries of the position described. In particular, there were a series of items that related to religious or spiritual issues and also issues of sexuality. Test takers who took the psych screen had to indicate yes or no to a series of questions. Among questions under the religious subheading were, I believe in a higher power, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, I believe that I will come again in another life. Under the sexuality heading, my sexual activities make me uncomfortable. I have engaged in sexual activity that others may find deviant. I am attracted to members of my same sex. These questions are highly personal and not really related to the skills and activities needed to be a security guard. And so the ruling was that the assessments used must collect information relevant to the position for which they are being used to decide. Since security guards are not asked to make decisions based on their religious or sexual preferences, collecting data on these variables would be inappropriate. Subsequently, the psych screen was dropped from Target department stores hiring protocol.
hopefully you see through all of these legal precedents and these lawsuits that assessment when not practiced in accordance with ethical standards and best practices opens us up to several problems to help ensure that we practice in a safe ethical and legal manner we should try to limit bias in our assessment bias comes in multiple different shapes and formats we could look at content bias whereby the test material is more familiar to one group than another so going back to the case in Florida where students in the poor more rural school districts did not have the content in their high school curriculum that was on the end of year test that's an example of content bias internal structure bias is when we have scores that are more reliable for one group but not for another in New York they were awarding scholarships based on SAT score but we know that SAT is a much more reliable and accurate predictor for males than females. And then finally, predictive bias. When an instrument or an assessment systematically over or under predicts a group's performance. In California, minority students being placed in special education classrooms at a rate much higher than white students. So to ensure fairness in the assessment process, there are some things that we should do. First, we should remember that our primary goal is to promote the welfare of the client. The entire practice of testing should be undertaken to benefit the client to advance the counseling process. It should not be used to impede their progress, hold them back, or disadvantage them in any way. We should engage in professional development opportunities. We cannot, as counselors, remain static in our knowledge and skill set. Advances in our profession are constantly occurring. And it is up to us to make sure that we are staying up to date with best practices so that we're able to provide our clients with the best possible care that we can. We also should continually monitor and challenge our personal beliefs and attitudes particularly as they relate to diversity. How do we feel about certain groups? Do our personal beliefs bleed into the counseling relationship? Are we compromising our professional integrity because of our personal beliefs? We need to be cognizant of the fact that we need to be fair to everyone. So constantly thinking about as we make decisions, particularly testing decisions, is this something that will benefit this client? Is this something that has been normed on this client's cultural group? And is this something that will in fact help me further the counseling process? In doing so, we're then able to demonstrate our competence and use practices that are culturally sensitive. Practices that are not going to be excluding certain groups of clients, but rather are more inclusive and work to promote a society that is beneficial to all. So through this lecture, you now should be familiar with some of the legal and ethical principles that relate to the practice of testing 
and assessment. Following these and keeping them at the forefront of your mind as you conduct assessments will help you work better with your clients and do so in a manner that is in alignment with best practices for your profession.